Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Barry Colfer. I'm the Director of Research here at the Institute. Absolutely thrilled to have those joining us here in person and indeed colleagues joining online for what's going to be a really interesting and important event on lessons for Irish reunification from Germany with our speaker, Tobias Locke, who's a professor of law at uh, uh, Maynooth University. I think myself and a lot of people here and online will probably still be suffering from uh, a, a, a night of limited sleep, given the uh, excitement last night watching what was happening with them across the water and their elections. So I think uh, a really good time to take a break from British politics and to focus on something a little bit different. So really pleased that Catherine Meenan, the chair of our Germany group, is going to be in the hot seat today chairing. Thanks as ever, Catherine, and over to you. OK, thanks, Barry. Um, and so I'm delighted to welcome you both here in the room and on Zoom to the webinar. And we're delighted to be joined today by Professor Tobias Locke, who's Professor of Law at Maynooth University. And he's we're very grateful that he's come to bring his expertise mm -hmm. to us. He will talk about 20 minutes or so, and then we go to Q&A. Um, you'll be able to join the discussion either in the room or using the Q&A function on Zoom. Uh, send your questions in, I ideally, throughout the session rather than all at the end, and we'll come to them as soon as Professor Tobias Locke has finished his presentation. Both the presentation and the Q&A will be on the record. So I'd like to formally introduce Professor Locke. He's Professor of Law at Maynooth University and the founding director of the Maynooth Centre for European Law. From 2020 to 23, he held the Jean Monnet Chair in EU Law and Fundamental Rights. He's originally from Germany, and he previously taught at the University of Edinburgh. His research focuses on EU constitutional and fundamental rights law, comparative constitutional law, and the relationship between EU law, domestic law, and international law. He's an EU law advisor to the Scottish Parliament and a member of the Royal Irish Academy Aaron's Project. And we're looking forward to what you have to say to us today. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and um, thanks a lot for coming uh, on this sunny afternoon after an exciting election uh, in, in, in across the water. Um, and thank you to the Institute for inviting me to speak here today. It's a great honor. Um, and the title uh, for my presentation today is uh, apparently, uh, I had to look it up, uh, are there any lessons that Ireland could learn from German reunification? And I suppose you don't just want me to say yes and walk off, uh, but uh, so I'll have to be a bit more specific uh, as to the background of my talk and what issues I will be addressing. Now, I don't need to spend too much time, I hope, on the background uh, since the UK's Brexit vote, for sure. Irish unification has become a more realistic prospect than it might have been before. While most polls are still indicating that the majority of people in Northern Ireland would currently vote to remain in the UK, the margins have narrowed, that's for sure. For instance, a lucid poll of uh, February recorded 49% in favour of uh, remaining in the UK versus 39 in favour of a United Ireland. But there's another important factor in all of this, and that's demographics. So under the, the under 45s uh, prefer the Irish unity option. So it's certainly something that has changed a good bit over the last couple of years. Um, so it's not unlikely that a border poll will be called at some point over the next, say, 15 to 20 years. That's just my guess, right, uh, time frame. Now, the background to this talk is therefore this. If there is to be a border poll, and most importantly, of course, if the vote is in favor of unification, a huge number of difficult political and legal questions will have to be answered. And Germany provides an example of a peaceful, democratic, and overall, I would think, successful unification process that happened relatively recently in our neighborhood, yeah, uh, West Germany, uh, West, Western Europe, and within the European Union, importantly. So my question is, what if any lessons could a uniting Ireland learn from German unification? Now, this talk is based on an article I wrote uh, uh, in 2022, or probably it was published in 2022, I wrote it before then, uh, for the Irish Studies in International Affairs. Um, and the anal analysis I want to conduct today, or I want to talk about today, is a legal analysis. It's important. I'm a lawyer. Uh, I can't tell you anything about politics or even economics. Uh, we, we're not very good at that. I'll obviously use a law in context approach. We have to put it all in the historic and political context as much as we can, but it's a legal analysis. Um, 
I still think it's 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 a valuable analysis in the sense that a legal analysis uh, tells us something about the process of unification because the process of unification will inevitably, if it's a peaceful unification, one that is affected through law and guided by law. So it's important to think about these things. And before we get into the detail, let's perhaps recall two basic sets of facts. First, what happened in Germany briefly in 89, 1990. And second, what the German and Irish contexts have in common and what uh, and how they differ. Now let's recall what happened 35, it's already 35 years ago in 1989, 1990. And in the summer of 1989, we saw a mass exodus of GDR citizens uh, from the GDR via e other Eastern Bloc states, about a million people left uh, over a couple of months. In September, 1989, newly formed citizens' rights groups organized weekly demonstrations, the so-called Monday demonstrations, with demands for more democracy. The slogan was, we are the people, wir sind das Volk, a very famous slogan. The GDR government tried to keep these secret, but obviously there was secret footage taken, smuggled out, it was aired on West German television, which most Easterners were able to receive, and you know, then they found out about it. Um, on 18th of October, the GDR's long-term leader, Erich Honecker, resigned, and the fall of the Berlin Wall then happened on the 9th of November. And this really got things moving, as you may recall, or at least know. Now, a frantic couple of months uh, were to follow. On 28th of November already, Helmut Kohl, the West German Chancellor, took the initiative and announced a 10-point program, a 10-point plan for German unification. So he set the scene with that. That was, of course, easier said than done and required first and foremost very delicate international negotiations with the four powers that had been victorious in World War II. The Americans could be convinced fairly uh, easily. Uh, the French and British proved to be slightly harder work, but obviously the big obstacle was the Soviet Union. Um, now the decision by Gorbachev not to react as the Soviet Union had done previously in Hungary in 1956 and 68 in the Czech Republic or in Czechoslovakia, as it was then called, was crucial for a peaceful process. These international negotiations resulted in the so-called two plus four treaty um, in which Germany won many concessions, important concessions actually, such as continued NATO membership and a complete removal of Soviet troops from the territory. On 18th of March, 1990, the GDR held its first free elections. There was a resounding win for the Christian Democrats and their center-right alliance, which had campaigned on a platform of quick reunification. And that basically made the decision for quick reunification um, with, by way of accession of the GDR to the Federal Republic. So that was an important uh, marker in all of this, I think. Now, this happened in two big steps, first of all, we had monetary, economic, and social union, uh, which happened on the 1st of July, 1990, and then a political union, which was proper reunification on 3rd of October, 1990. Meanwhile, the other EU member states at a summit here in Dublin had endorsed the proposed reunification of Germany as an accession by the GDR and leaving Germany's EU membership unaffected. And then finally, on the 2nd of December 1990, we had the first federal elections, a pan-German federal elections. Um, and that was it, yeah. So what do you note is that it happened very, very fast, right? It's less than 11 months from the fall of the Berlin Wall to reunification. Secondly, it happened in an international context. Third, reunification was the result of different sets of negotiations Fourth, it happened by way of accession. That is really important. The Federal Republic of Germany continued to exist as a state under the same constitution and so on. I will come back to that. And simply extended its territory to the GDR and the population of the GDR, they became German citizens fully. Uh, and the GDR itself disappeared, was gone. So if we want to glean lessons from the German experience, I think we can. Uh, and we need to become aware of the commonalities and differences between the two. Now, the differences, I want to start with the differences. There are loads of differences, of course. Now, obviously, the most important difference is that the populations of Western East Germany consisted of one German people, right? At least as far as their self-perception was concerned, right? And, and, and you can see that these Monday demonstrations, the slogan was, wir sind das Volk, we are the people, and it morphed into, wir sind ein Volk, we are one people later on. So it's very important. It's quite, quite, Quite a nice uh, way of, of looking at it. 
And the same is obviously not true for the population of Northern Ireland, right? Which is characterized by this ethnic division between British and Irish, uh, Protestants, Catholics, whatever you want to call them. And I don't think I need to explain that to you. But when it came, German unification came as a surprise to most. Yes, the German constitution, the basic law had envisaged it, yeah. Uh, and West Germany had a day of German unity, even before German unity happened, 17th of June which commemorated the uprising in the GDR in 1953. And there were solemn speeches and everybody said, yeah, we want German unification, but nobody really believed it was gonna happen. So no preparations had been made whatsoever. Not much practical thinking had been done. No realistic route for peaceful unification had been defined. There was nothing. And Irish unity, I think would be different. You know, I mean, we're talking about it now, uh, but there is an established pathway. Um, in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, which recognizes, and that's a quote, that it is for the people of the island of Ireland alone, by agreement between the two parts respectively, and without external impediment to exercise their right of self-determination on the basis of consent, freely and concurrently given, North and South, to bring about a united Ireland, if that is their wish, accepting that this right must be achieved and exercised with, with and subject to the agreement and consent of a majority of the people of Northern Ireland. So there's a pathway. And this suggests that if Irish unity happens, it will happen after a protracted process. First of all, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland will have to arrange for a border poll. Second, there would be a campaign, I would imagine, uh, probably north and south, because it's likely that the south will be holding a referendum on the same day. Third, some of the parameters of a united Ireland are predefined in the Good Friday Agreement. We know some things that will have to be secured into the future. The Irish state has signed up to that as uh, is committed to that. And so Irish unification, if it happens, won't be coming as a surprise overnight. Another difference is that obviously there are no major systemic differences between Northern Ireland and, 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 and this country here uh, in legal, economic, political terms, right? The Western democracies, more or less, integrated into you know, a capitalist system and so on. Another difference is the German was and is a federation, yeah, which I think in many senses made unification easier. Ireland is probably the most centralized country in the EU, at least of the bigger ones, of the, of the you know, ones that are not uh, Luxembourg. Um, and this will prove challenging, I think. The greater geopolitical context will be missing. Um, I know this is all very important for us. Yeah, we're inhabiting this small corner of the North Atlantic, but you know, and the rest of the world, you know, they'll take an interest, but it won't change their lives, uh, so the, that, which is good. Um, while West Germany was an EU or rather an EEC member at the time of unification, the EU has moved on considerably. It's doing a lot more things. Most importantly, it's doing monetary union. We've got the Euro. And that of course means that Ireland can't just agree monetary union with the North without the consent or without you know, the cooperation of the other Eurozone countries and of the ECB. So it's, Europe will have a much stronger involvement in all of this, even if, of course, the EU has agreed in principle that they would facilitate uh, unification. But you know, you need, need to think about the technicalities. And finally, while both the GDR and Northern Ireland have different legacies, there's probably little to be learned from one another. The contexts are too different. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're all, uh, they've all got their problems, but they're so different that we can't really learn from one another very much anyway. Now let's move on to the commonalities. They're the more interesting ones. Now, obviously there are similarities in terms of relative population sizes, West and East and South and North. In 1989, West Germany had a population of about 62 million and East Germany about 16.4, apparently. And if I didn't make a mistake, the ratio was somewhere around 3.9 to one. Ireland South currently has a population of 5.1, growing very fast, and there are about 1.9 million in Northern Ireland, not growing very fast. So we have a ratio of about 2.7 to 1. That's going to get bigger. But, you know, economies are harder to... I mean, that's, you know, the, the controversy. I, mean, I said I wasn't going to do economy, economics, but, you know, I mean, just uh, 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 for a very basic point, uh, so allegedly East Germany, and I don't think that data is correct, but anyway, they had a per capita GDP of $9,679 uh, in 1989, West Germany 17,764, so pretty much double. Ireland's GDP is famously inflated, so it's useless, but Ireland has a modified GNA, GNI of about 52,000 per capita. 
Northern Ireland has a GDP, which obviously I'm comparing apples and pears, but I'm not an economist, economist so I can do that, uh, of 35,000 per capita. So, you know, obviously the differences aren't that stark, but what we can say is I think that in case of unification, in both cases, a smaller and economically less prosperous part is joining a bigger and more prosperous part. Um, more important than these numbers, which I think people will want to dispute, uh, is this. If it happens, Irish unification will happen, I hope anyway, through a peaceful and democratic process. And this means that it will be will have to be done through law and will be negotiated between the different parties. And that is an important parallel. East and West Germany negotiated those treaties on monetary, economic, and social union, as well as the treaty on unity. Ireland and Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland possibly or probably represented by the UK government, would be negotiating a treaty detailing the modalities of unification. There has to be some agreement. There's additionally the international dimension. The two Germanys had the trickier task here. They had to face negotiations with the two superpowers, with France, with Britain as well, not two superpowers. Uh, there were also negotiations within the European Union context. And one of the reasons we have the euro, perhaps, is because Helmut Kohl had to promise that to Francois Mitterrand, that the European Germany was going to take part in economic and monetary union. Uh, as a price uh, for uh, uh, unification. Um, but that EU context is going to be more difficult, as I've just said. I mean, there's some technicalities. There are more MEPs and different votes in the council and all of that. That's easy. There might have to be modifications to the Windsor framework of some sort, but we don't know what the UK might want, perhaps, in terms of flow of population and trade east-west, and more importantly, the Eurozone I have no idea how you would do that. Yeah, I'm not an economist, but it needs to be sorted out. How do you merge the economies uh, in terms of, of currency? And what follows, I want to focus on these uh, commonalities. First of all, wider context. It's important to understand, I think, and I can't reiterate as the third time I'm saying this, that German unification was an accession process. The GDR acceded to the Federal Republic. This GDR ceased to exist. The Federal Republic was the continuing state which had grown in size. This meant that all of Germany's international relations continued as before. NATO membership, EU membership, UN membership, you name it, yeah? Uh, all treaty relations continued as before. More interestingly, perhaps, from an Irish perspective, is that the West German constitution, the basic law, the Grundgesetz, was merely very slightly amended uh, and extended to the territory of the GDR, but no new constitution was drafted, even though there had been calls for that. An attempt by the opposition parties to then secure constitutional reform later on was included in the Treaty on Unity, but was not successful. I mean, not very much happened in the constitutional reform in 1994, I think it happened. It came to very little. Um, certainly the basic law was not replaced. And that's kind of ironic because the basic law was meant to be only temporarily in place. That's why it was called the basic law. It was not never called the constitution, right? I mean, they only said uh, until we reunite, uh, but it's, it's, we still have it 75 years on, okay? And I think that Irish unification would also be affected by way of accession. It's, it would be slightly different because Northern Ireland is not a sovereign entity. So what would happen is we would have a transfer of sovereignty from the UK to Ireland on a given date. But... Ireland era, this country that we are in, this jurisdiction, will continue to exist as it has before. Our treaty relations will remain the same. Um, and technically, the constitution could remain the same. Yes, you may have to make a few changes to it. Yeah, you know, one of the changes that would be necessary, I think, in order to comply with the Good Friday Agreement is actually to make good on the birthright provisions, allow British citizens active and passive franchise in all elections, including presidential and referendums, which they don't currently have, European Union elections as well, which they don't currently have. Um, but that's about it, you know? Uh, so it's, it's, it's not an automa automatic uh, uh, constitutional change that will come with it. Um, now, the process would be different. Uh, German unification was brought about by way of one expression of consent. It was only East Germany that had to apply for it, so to speak, under this route, uh, which they did not 
directly. There was never a referendum held there, but the first three elections resulted in such a resounding victory for the let's get reunified now side uh, that, you know, that was considered to be enough. West Germans didn't, uh, weren't asked, um, which may or may not have been a mistake. I don't know. Um, we can discuss that later. Um, in Ireland, we will have two, probably two referendums, certainly one in the north and most most likely in the south as well. So it's, it's a different, we have two expressions of consent. Both sides have to agree to it. If, if the south, for whatever reason, unlikely, voted no and the yes vote, north voted yes, there would be no reunification. It's very important to remember. Um, and those questions about process are interesting because they've been teased out by Brendan O'Leary and he, you know, he distinguishes two different approaches that you could choose. You have this, this model approach. So you have like the, uh, maybe a new draft constitution and, you know, everything is, is, is there. Everybody knows exactly what they're voting for and you will then have a vote. Uh, or you have more of a process approach where you say, okay, we're going to vote now, say yes. If you say yes, then we're going to negotiate the details. Um, I think that was well, probably going to be, if, 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 if it happens, it would probably be more of, a, in my view, more of a process type approach. I don't think you can have a model that is agreed by unionists, for instance, in advance of a referendum. I, I, don't, I don't think that's, that's realistic. They, they won't want to engage on that. Obviously, you can have models that, you know, you can have promises made by the or commitments made by, say, the Irish government and the UK government. And we're going to ensure this. We're going to ensure that. that sh that's for sure. But I think a, a final decision as to how a united Ireland would look, I don't think in advance, I don't think is realistic. So there's going to be more of a process. But maybe I, I'm, I'm wrong. I mean, we, we, we will probably find out at some point. And if I'm right in this, that, you know, there will be lots of questions to be decided, then Germany has a number of uh, lessons to offer. Certainly, when it comes to the constitution, and I think this is something I'd like to hammer home, because a lot of people seem to assume there's going to be a new constitution if there's a united Ireland. That is not a given. Um, as I said, the, the, the temporary can easily become the permanent. Um, the basic law remained the German constitution. Well, for good reasons in many respects, I mean, it's, a good, it's a good constitution on the whole. Yeah, with 75 years of a democracy, it's not bad by German standards. You know, it's a, it's, it's a fairly good record. Uh, haven't invaded anybody in that time. And, and you know, so it's, 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 it's not bad. Um, but from the perspective of East Germans, they never had a say in this, right? They weren't asked, do we want this constitution? They weren't included in this process. So, I mean, this idea of a takeover, which, you know, is, is, is felt uh, in, in, in some parts, at least, that, that, that uh, wasn't dispelled. And the same, obviously, same danger exists uh, in, in Ireland. Um, so the lesson, I think, is this. If a united, uniting Ireland is serious about replacing the constitution with an all-Ireland constitution, there needs to be a firm commitment to do so. It has to be a legally binding commitment. Of course, you could use the old Bonnrath Naheran as a temporary fix. The, it can accommodate things like Stormont, for instance, under Article 15, no problem. You have to make a few changes, but it would have to be a mandatory revision at some point and then a vote on this. And I think that could be done, but you have to put it into place because, you know, these kinds of promises of reform, you know, we know how long these things can take if there's no commitment to them. Now, another parallel with Germany is the international dimension. The Belfast Good Friday Agreement has done, done some work here already, so we know quite a lot, but further negotiations will be necessary around the modalities of the transfer of sovereignty, about money, in particular sovereign debt, pensions, who's going to pay for them, assets, military installations, all sorts of things that need to be agreed with the UK. The British government might want to see additional protections for unionists. Um, what they might be, I don't know. The question here is, who would be negotiating on behalf of Northern Ireland? Is there anyone who would represent the interests of Northern Ireland? It's not clear. The treaty would certainly have to be between the UK and Ireland, because they're the uh, obviously, Northern Ireland would disappear as well uh, as uh, as an entity, uh, uh, as 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 we know it. it. Might be reinstated under Irish law, but it's 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 not a sovereign uh, country. So, um, 
would the executive be involved? If there is an executive in Northern Ireland, you know, I mean, imagine a, a vote going in favor of, uni of unity, would the, would the executive still exist? Would it be able to survive that? Would unionists walk out? All of these things are tricky and, and I think they need to be thought about. The German case was, well, on the face of it, more egalitarian. The East German and the West German government uh, negotiated, but of course, uh, the East German government had been supplied with Western civil servants to have the know-how of how to actually do this because, you know, um, they, they, they didn't have the manpower and the, 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 the apparatchiks that were in place were not trusted, I would imagine, with, with, with negotiating uh, honestly on behalf of East Germany. And so there wasn't a whole lot to negotiate. And also, I mean, the approach was very much uh, one of, you know, we're taking West German law and that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, so accusations of this kind of takeover or annexation. And, you know, if you, if you read, I did some Googling and it, it, the, the left wing or the left in, in Germany was, in West Germany was broadly speaking opposed to, to, to quick reunification uh, anyway, right? And you read the writings of people like Günter Kras are, Nobel Prize winner and, and, and those, as they were very, very skeptical. And, you know, some of the, the more left-wing writers used terms like Anschluss. And Anschluss is obviously the term the Nazis used for the annexation of Austria in 1938. So it wasn't meant to be nice as a, as a, as a, as a descriptive term anyway. So you can see that, you know, and in the Irish context, I think obviously the negotiating partners would be a bit more equal. Yeah, UK, they know, they know what they're doing. Uh, it, it, well, one would hope anyway, but they know how they know they know negotiations. It's not the first time they will be involved in those, um, and both will probably, I think, hopefully, have as their foremost aim to ensure a peaceful transition, a peaceful future. I think that that will probably be hopefully their guiding, the guiding light. Nonetheless, it's important you know to remember that you know this German reunification was a very one-sided affair. I mean, for East Germans, everything changed, right? Everything. Uh, uh, for West Germans, next to nothing. I'm from West Germany. I um, mean, obviously I was still little, but not, not much changed. I, I can remember that uh, uh, for sure. Uh, the most tangible change for West Germans was the solidarity tax that they had to pay. It's only being phased out now. I think if you're still, if you're, if you're still paying it, you're very well off, basically. That's, it's, it's good news for you. But it's fluctuated somewhere between 3.75 and 7.5% on top of your income tax. And it was always on your, I, I checked it out this morning, it was always on your uh, payslip. It said solidarity tax. So it's not, it wasn't hidden somewhere in income tax. No, no, you, you knew. I mean, I'm paying, what, 150 euro a month for them. Uh, now, everybody had to pay it, even East Germans. So it was not like only West Germans had to pay it. But it, it, was, it, didn't, it didn't help, yeah, uh, I think, uh, friendly relations. Uh, other changes, well... Not really very many. One of them is that you, you can now take a right turn at a red light if there's a green arrow. That was a GDR thing. Um, we have that now. Good. We have the friendly little uh, Ampelmann, the, 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 the little uh, fella at the pedestrian crossings who looks nicer in the GDR version. Uh, and that is now represented in West Germany sometimes. And we have a slightly, perhaps, yeah, slightly more liberal abortion regimes ever so slightly and that is also uh, thanks to reunification but that's about it you know not very much has changed now let's look briefly uh, as i said i was going to give you a legal analysis uh, at some more detail of what the treaties on german unity and monetary social and economic union contain they're actually quite something there's something to behold uh, very long, very de incredibly detailed. I mean, I, I'm not able to understand every single line of them because they're so detailed. And uh, you can see the amount of work that went into them in an incredibly short period of time. They dealt with, you know, practicalities, social security system, tax system, and the legal system more generally. They introduced West German law into East Germany. And I think they're a masterpiece of, of, of legal drafting. Now, Ireland would have to do this as well. But for Ireland, it would be much more difficult in many respects because in Ireland, in the Irish case, the, the decision what law to use in the future is not an, an obvious one. In, in, in the German case, it was fairly obvious. We weren't going to use East German property law, yeah, which was based on a completely different ideology. That's easy. But how, how do you merge health systems north and south if you're going to merge them? What about education or policing? They are controversial topics, right? So difficult questions to be answered. 
Then mundane topics, private law, company law, family law, contract law, tort law, you know, you name it, property law. All the mundane things that govern our day-to-day -day lives, they have to be sorted out somehow. And there is no clear answer. I mean, I couldn't tell you, is Northern Irish family law better than Southern Irish family law? Well, maybe not, but, you know, I don't, I don't know. Uh, are UK company law rules better suited than Irish company law rules? I don't know. Um, so you have to make these decisions on what evidentiary basis? I don't know. And who's going to make these decisions? I mean, we can't have a referendum on all of these or, you know, I mean, uh, the doll would be, you know, overburdened for years just trying to figure these things out. So that, these are difficult questions. Um, and what can we learn from Germany here? Well, maybe two things. Uh, the legal techniques employed in, Ger in the German case were quite, I mean, they're not, they didn't reinvent the wheel, but they were creative. Uh, they consisted in front loading. So a lot of stuff was, I mean, some stuff was done before reunification. For instance, East Germany recreated the, the, the five states that make up East Germany, five and a half. Uh, Berlin was split. So West Berlin took over East Berlin in that sense. But uh, those five states that have been recreated, they could then easily be slotted into the West German system uh, on, on, on the day of unity. We have certain directly applicable rules in the Treaty on Unity, so we just apply that as law. We have binding instructions to the future legislatures that there, there were going to be. Uh, provisional arrangements, transition periods, phasing in, phasing out, use of conflict rules. Um, so there's, in, in legal terms, it's, 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 quite a, it's, it's, it's really a quite, a, quite, a, quite a thing to behold. Now, most people won't share that uh, love of, of legal drafting, but, but I certainly do. Secondly, the other lesson is the, the sheer amount of work that is required. Unification is a gargantuan task. Right? I mean, and, and, and if it happens, it'll really test the state capacity of the Irish state. Um, West Germany had 60 million inhabitants at the time. They had you know, a, a civil service to match a state of, uh, maybe even, even more than match a, six, <laughs> a state of 60 million people, because we have a civil service at the federal level, but also at the, at the lender level. You know? um, so the state apparatus was big. Ireland, North and South combined, at the moment, about 7 million people with a state apparatus to manage that, thereabouts, you know. Um, but the number of technical questions that need to be answered and resolved are, are, are very, very similar. Yeah? It's, it's, it's not, you know, that's the that's advantage of being a big country, of economy, economies of scale. If you're a small country, you have to do the same things, but just for fewer people. Now, some of the answers that will, need to, that will be required will be easier to give than in the German case. Some of the answers that will uh, be required will be much harder to give than in the German case. And this leads me to the main conclusion for Ireland from the German experience. And that is, if you want this to be a success, you have to be prepared. And that's it. Thank you very much.